Tower of God chapter 630 was the most amazing chapter we've had since chapter 621, where Enkidu exposed Traumari a little bit until they got confused. But guys, this chapter was revolutionary. We got the reveal of V. Traumari is on trial. He is about to get exposed. Gustang is officially dead. As we were speaking, guys, Gustang is fucking dead. So much stuff happened in this chapter, it is mind boggling. So guys, this is going to be my second one hour special for Tower God on this channel. Thank you so much for participating in the stream. Thank you so much for watching the stream and viewing it guys and VOD viewers, shout out to you. Yeah, I, I know you guys are out there. That's why I put those little timestamps. Thank you so much guys. That was an amazing stream. We had like 26 people, 20 ish average, awesome stream, amazing chapter, amazing audience. Uh, awesome guys. So. Let's get right into this review. So I'm gonna start off with a, kind of a brief summary. I'm gonna try to make it brief of the whole chapter. So we continue from last chapter automatically. We do not even get like a preface or anything, like a little recap. We start with a fresh panel of Gastang's head being sliced off by Traumari. And right after that, we get a flashback immediately. So we go back into the era where Traumari and Gustang were about to become family leaders. And Traumari is mourning after his dead animals. Like they are right in front of him. There's like a dead horse, a dead oxalotl, like a bunch of dead shit in front of Traumari. And he is pissed. He is very upset and pissed. And what I'm thinking happened here is like a bandit or something came over and killed Traumari's animals. So he took that very personal. He doesn't appreciate that. So this Traumari is very different. This is a very different Traumari in this era. He actually has emotion. He actually cares about stuff. And he said one line that resonates throughout this whole chapter. He says, I only need you guys. I won't be lonely. And then right after those lines, we cut right back into the present. So this resonates very strongly throughout the whole chapter because right after Gustang dies, or I guess supposedly dies, he's kind of like in purgatory limbo right now. He says he doesn't need anyone. So I'm kind of glossing over some big chunks of the chapter. What I really want to do is just, just get this whole general idea out of the chapter, like this whole summary, and then go into the nitty gritty details after I give you a summary. So let's continue with the main events in the chapter. So Traumari just gives no shit. So he just killed Gustang, like one of his best friends that he climbed with in the very beginning of the tower. And Gustang's blood manifests into writing. And as I predicted, and as many predicted in the last chapter, Gustang wrote something down in his paper and it triggered a command to be executed beyond Traumari's control. So an interesting thing about this spell, oh, is it a spell? I don't think it's a spell, but I guess, uh, what, what even is this, a technique? I guess a uh, interesting thing about this technique is that it even has an administrator's approval. So as we know, Enryu is the only person in his whole story who killed an administrator. So what I'm thinking is Enryu and uh, Phantom Minium, they're the only people who can kill or at least hold their own against an administrator. Everyone else, I mean, we don't know about Jihad or uh, Urek, but everyone else, like they're below the administrators. So. That's already established in a story. So all of a sudden, this thing called the Scales of Judgment comes out of nowhere. So what I'm thinking happened is Gusang had this item hidden away from the other family leaders and he used his script writing uh, pen, his overpowered pen to, to like make this whole command come to life. And this guy with one eye, the Cyclops looking guy, his hair looks like the blue Thrissa. He comes out and he brings Traumari to judgment. So this is where the chapter is like rising. It is insane at this point because Traumari once for once in his life, he is going to be held accountable for his actions. So from this point onward, we just get flashbacks. Well, we get one flashback. We, we're going to continue it in the next chapter. But we go into a flashback where Traumari was fighting against the giant robots with his companions. So we see Jihad, we see Edwan, Traumari, Gustang, and Lee Rang. They are all in this chapter. They're all the main characters. Well, they're not all the main characters. It's mainly Lee Rang, Traumari, and Gustang. But they're, they're all here, they have a little bit of screen time. And then we also see V at the very end, but I'll get back to that later. 
So they're all fighting. They're actually struggling. We this is the first time we see the family head struggle. But of course, I mean, it's, it's very obvious they're not at their prime here. They're still climbing the tower. They're like pre data world bomb. Like bomb had to grow slowly. He didn't have all his regular powers unlocked. Like he was he was barely growing his regular powers as time went on. So this is kind of where those family heads are at. And it's good like this time they have each other, right? They're all irregulars. So unlike bomb, bomb has weak teammates. He has a Dorsey Kuhn. I mean, yeah, Kuhn, Kuhn is a uh, like, direct ascendant, I believe. He's a part of the great families. And Doris, he's a princess of Jihad, but these are full-fledged irregulars. So it is easier for them to climb the tower. Although, I mean, the tower was more untamed, but you know, they're all irregulars. That's what matters. So let's get back into the main story. So Gustang and Tramurai are running away and then they get pushed into this building and uh, uh, Tramurai's Kraken comes out and it looks fully grown. I'm surprised because back in that flashback we saw where Tramurai was reading that book or he was or no when he said he was uh, in a library and had a little flashback the Kraken was very small unless it was a different animal. It was very teeny tiny and he's wearing the same outfit here. Well anyway they get into this room and there is this like teleporter and they want to disconnect the main power to the robots because they are all being overwhelmed. So while Jihad and uh, everyone else is fighting, these guys, Traumarai and Gustang, are going to try to disconnect their power for the robots. And as soon as Gustang wants to jump in, Lee Rain comes in and she is like being very careful. She's being very cautious and she says, hey, wait up. We, we need to contact V and Jihad. So this right here, very interesting line. She says V and Jihad as if they are like the leaders of this whole group, or they could be interpreted as they are the strong. I think it goes both ways. Uh, I mean, we know that the tower is regulated by power and fame or how much of an impact you have. So, I mean, I guess V and Jihad kind of share like a leadership role. And we know at the very end, they both went their separate ways with V wanting, looking in the best interest for the people in general, like the whole tower and Jihad looking in the best interest for his own companions and pushed all the other tower borns aside. So back to the story, Lee Rang, Gustang, and Tramrai hop in the teleporter and they run into the God of the Guardians. We finally see this character again since season two. We have not seen this guy. It has been so long. SIU has definitely been cooking this up. He, man, I love it when SIU does that, when he brings back characters from so long ago and he brings them back into the present. It is such a great touch in writing. So this guy, we already know it's gonna go on. He is standing on top of the rice pot. We already know that these irregulars are going to become true irregulars when they get out of the rice pot. But to our surprise, someone was already in the rice pot and that someone happens to be V. So V comes out. He is completely naked, except he has it's like underwears on and that is it. This guy is a fucking Chad. Like his aura is huge, dude. Like, you know how the family leaders have an aura, like even though Norsi and Belvair are like not really feeling it. This dude's aura is like triple that. Look at this guy, man. He is fucking Chad. So that is where the chapter ends. We get a V face reveal, body reveal, all the above. The only question I have about V is, is V his real name? Is that just his name? Is his name literally a letter? I mean, I'm not complaining, but I wish SIU clarified because we have this viol thing going on. We don't know what V really stands for. Is that really just his name? No last name either. Well, anyway, guys, that is a chapter. Let's dig into the nitty gritty stuff. Let's start all the way from the beginning. So let's go back into the trauma. I flashback the first one right as soon as Gustain got his head cut off. So in this scene, Traumarai is mourning over a pile of dead animals and Gustang is like right behind him, comforting him. And we can see that Gustang, like he doesn't really care. Like to him, it's like, oh, whatever. I mean, you probably have a whole bunch of them anyway. So like, what's the point? But the thing is, I think the whole point of this flashback is to show Traumarai's change over time. So 
I'm gonna be jumping a little bit ahead here, but let me just get this out of the way. The family leaders since, as far as we can recall, have been dispatching their memories left and right. So anything bad that happens, such as the Enkidu, MUs, and traumatized atrocities, whatever happens with these family leaders, they dispatch their memories. So when did this start happening? I think this started happening as soon as they reach the top of the tower, or I guess the fake top of the tower, the 134th floor, and they made contracts with the administrators to become immortal and to rule over the tower. I think there's also an event before that that split them all apart. So it's kind of confusing. There's a lot of missing puzzle pieces in this whole dilemma, but they have been getting rid of their memories, and I think the only one who hasn't done that is V. And maybe Jihad as well, because Jihad wants to remain in power. He wants to be the one that knows everything, that sees in the future. Like, he has all these special abilities, so I think it would only make sense if Jihad doesn't get rid of his memories as well. But we do see the difference between Data Jihad and the current Jihad, and it's a night and day difference. Like... The Data Jihad is so full of life, he wants to keep exploring, he wants to keep fighting people, he feels something for Bomb, like, he feels that Bomb can, can push his future self to his limits, and you know, Data Jihad is like very ambitious, and the current Jihad, present Jihad, he's like, very just complacent, he doesn't really care about that much, so, over time, I think, these family heads and jihad they just really they they drew that fine line between themselves and the towerborns and they just don't care about anyone else except themselves and their relationship between each other and i think a big contributor to this is becoming the rulers of the tower so to become rulers they had to dispatch their humanity and humility towards the other towerborns so they see themselves as rulers that they're above all so who are these people to share the same throne with them or to be on equal leveling with them like they don't see everyone else as equals like not even as a human they don't even see anyone as a human or like as a person they treat them like shit so with that out of the way we get back into the chapter this little segment i was talking about where tron right he is feeling very down about his animals he's saying that they fought for them and they helped them climb the tower and all of a sudden someone decided to kill them and tron right is pissed off he says i want to gather them all in one place burn them to the ground burn them to ashes like he really wants to get revenge like he is actually offended and pissed off about his animals dying and as Traumari is saying this, his disconnection technique manifests and he's just throwing his blades all over the place. And we even get a little translator note that kind of clarifies what Traumari means by this. And he pretty much wants to erase the people who did this to his animals out of the face of the earth. Like that is how angry he is. And Gustang takes this literally. He says that the tower is very vast, so like it's very hard to catch these people. And if they kill everyone anyway, it's like doesn't mean anything to them being family heads because who's left to rule over? And Tramrai responds by saying he doesn't care as long as he has his companions, which are the great family warriors and Jihad. They are fine. He is fine with that. And that is enough for him. He doesn't need anyone else. And he also says, when we get strong enough, let's disconnect from everyone else. So that is very interesting. Even though they are pretty strong right now, I guess they are not strong enough to like really rule a tower completely. I think they're almost there. This might be before the AMU's marriage thing, but they're not quite there yet. And Tramrai does something very interesting. He puts his dead animals in his Shinwan Ryu. So I guess his Shinwan Ryu is like an eternal place for his animals to rest. Maybe he's doing some necromancy stuff in here, kind of like what La Chute was doing. I think she had those guys controlled, like they were already dead, but she kept reviving them. Which is really creepy because if that is the case, Traumarai Shinwan Ryu is a pile of dead bodies. It is just a fucking slew of corpse marching at people. That is insane. That is really creepy. There was also that one scene where Kun marched into Traumarai's place. Like Traumarai was sitting on top of a Shinwan Ryu and he was just looking over it. So I guess Traumarai from time to time, he just looks at all his dead animals and I guess he kind of remembers like what they did for him. I don't know. That's just a little detail I noticed. He kind of looks over Shin Wan Ryu like it's a nest. Like he's a mother of his nest and he looks over all his eggs. That's how I kind of look at it now with this proper context. 
In this next scene, we see Jihad approaching Tramurai while he is sitting on his throne. So maybe this was a week or a little bit of time past the events because Jihad needs to get Tramurai while he's still emotional. So he can't wait too long. I'm thinking this is a time like right before they're about to become the next like family leaders. Or I guess the official family heads of the tower and they are kind of all iffy about it. So Jihad is trying to convince everybody to take the immortality contract to rule the tower. We gotta remember that Jihad can see the future, so he has some powers that these guys do not have and maybe more, so he has that advantage. And of course, Jihad is a master manipulator. He's gonna try to get everybody going his way, the way he wants things to get done, and Tron right is as easy as pawn as of right now. So if he gets Tron right to bend over for him, he can get everyone else to follow through because if they see one family head obeying Jihad, that gives Jihad like a lot more power, like a lot more substance to his character and to his leadership. So we see Jihad getting very touchy, very, very touchy with Tramrai. He first, he grips his hand and then he like gropes it afterwards. Like he is getting very touchy with Tramrai and he is trying to butter him up and he is telling him that we've had to make so many changes along our journey around the tower. Hour. This is another change we're gonna have to make. So Jihad's speech level is at level 100 because this guy uses all the correct words, all the correct literary devices to convince Tramurai to follow through with him. And he tells Tramurai, like he uses a metaphor about the levers that we had to make all these changes. And then he tells them that we are the good. We are the absolute good in this tower and nothing can change that. So straight up, Jihad just turned into a politician. The politician saying that he is a good, we are the good guys, there's nothing wrong with us. And everything we do is right and in good faith. So he ties this in with Tramari's past, Tramari's guilt with his animals, and he gets him while well, Tramari is very vulnerable, and this causes a permanent rupture in Tramari's character, and he just trusts Jihad 100% from here on out. I would also like to highlight a key word or a key phrase, I should say, that Jihad used. He said, we shouldn't feel any emotion about it. That is very important. So I am convinced that this is the point where they have to make the decision to dispatch their emotions in return for immortality and leadership over the entire tower. And to be a proper leader, these guys need to act on logic and complete 100% logic with no emotion intact whatsoever so I think that is a contract or I guess the cost administrators ask these guys to make because as you know in his story what we've seen especially right now with the saying thing going on you cannot just get the stuff from the administrator without something like giving something up in return and Jihad also says well at least the translator says that we are the absolute good means that we should not take the other people's lives into consideration. So this whole ideology where the family heads are the rulers of the tower and that anything below them is insignificant started from Jihad. Jihad is a progenitor of this mindset and he is spreading it around like a virus. So I'm pretty sure this is why V and Jihad split up into two different factions because V took other people's lives and well-being into consideration even if they were not as strong as him and Jihad only looked off for his companions who were the regulars. So ever since the beginning, Jihad has been trying to manipulate people and Tramrai was his easiest target. And since Tramrai is like his most loyal fan, it wasn't hard for Jihad to get him to do his dirty bidding. And it seems like every time Tramrai is going through some shit, Jihad just throws in his two cents. Like with Amy Yuz, he said that Amy Yuz was not a creature like them or she was a creature or something around those lines. Like Jihad is always throwing his two sense at Tramrai to try to curve him his way and I have a theory that Jihad orchestrated the attack on Tramrai's animals so he can have a perfect opportunity to twist him his way to accept the immortality contract. Because I don't know, I don't really see like random Towerborns killing Tramrai's animals. I mean, unless they were like farm animals or just wild animals he had that were not empowered by him whatsoever. Like I have no idea. But maybe Jihad had a part in this. Maybe he hired some hitmen so he can get an opportunity to convince Tramrai to join him and become a ruler of the tower. 
Back into the present, we get a surprise dialogue from Tramurai. He says he does not care anymore even if Gustang is not there. He doesn't feel lonely anymore. So, like I was saying earlier, these guys, Tramurai, Gustang, all the family heads, they've dispatched so many memories that it just took away the character that they were supposed to be. Like, they were not supposed to be this way. But since they messed up their head so much and got rid of so many memories and, and feelings and emotions, they ended up being these heartless husks that don't care about anything. They're just so inhumane. Like this is not normal. As humans, we learn from our experiences and we grow and develop from there. And eventually we become these solidified beings after so many things have happened to us. But in this case, in Tower of God, these guys, like especially Tramurai, like for Tramurai in particular, if if anything bothers him he just throws it away to leviathan and it doesn't bother him anymore like these guys they don't really just stay human because they just dispatch whatever memories to bother them like the whole amu situation they dispatch those memories and they don't remember that so they end up losing their humanity and it got so bad that Tramurai does not care that he just killed his former best friend. He literally sliced his head off. He would be dead if he didn't pull up a scripture, but Tramurai doesn't care that he just killed his former best friend, dude. Like that is insane. So right below Tramurai's feet, the text from the scripture appears and it comes out from the scales of judgment that the workshop master produced for Gustang. The first few lines of text say these scriptures engraved with noble blood sacrificed and approved of the administrator will become an unbreakable convenient so right away we know that this scripture is backed up by the administrator which like i said earlier the only people who surpass the administrator that we know of are enryu and the access users like phantom minium so the scales of judgment focuses on the absolute facts of the past with no subjective view whatsoever which is a great item because we we need to know the truth. We need to know the solidified truth here because Gustang, he never got to find out the truth 100%. Enkidu spoke a little bit, but he didn't know whether to trust Enkidu, a guy he barely knew, or Tramurai, a guy he's known like ever since the beginning of their climb. So from this point onward, Tramurai is officially on trial because of the scales of judgment. And I really like this writing. So hear me out, guys. This writing is spectacular because this is an item that is backed up by Gustang's noble blood. So it took a sacrifice to get to this point. It didn't just come out like this random OP item out of nowhere. No, it took Gustang's life to make this item have this great effect that it has. And the effect is so potent that it can actually kill Tramurai, just like insta-kill him if he doesn't comply and tell the truth and acknowledge the truth. Tramurai also has to bow down and ask for forgiveness, so will he let himself go this low and beg for forgiveness to save his life? I don't know, because you know what? A lot of people want Tramurai to be held accountable. Tramurai just went on this huge power trip a few chapters ago with Enkidu saying that he controls the truth and nothing else matters. Like this guy is so full of himself and just right now with Holan too. Like a lot of people really want to see this guy go down. They really want the worst for him. They hate him. His whole family betrayed him. Everybody fucking hates Stromerai. Just one criticism, this is probably my only criticism for this whole chapter, is I wish, man, I wish more family heads were watching this. Like, I know Urek might show up, I know Luzik might show up any minute, but goddamn, dude, I wish there was a whole audience watching this because, I mean, that's how it works in a real world. Like, you have, like, a jury, you have all the people watching, there's, like, a bunch of people witnessing the trial, but there's nobody here. There's only Enkidu and Endorsi, and, like, that's it. Nobody else is in this arena, man. Like, nobody else is watching. This would have so much of a bigger world impact if there were more people watching, if the whole tower was watching, because this is big. One of the rulers of the tower is being held accountable and they are being held on trial. Like, this is huge. Everybody should be watching this, man. 
along with that, we are about to see Tramari exposed, like 100% exposed. We are going into all their memories, man. Like, this is very personal. Like, all of Tramari's dark secrets are going to be exposed, but nobody else is watching, man. I wish, I hope all the other family leaders, they come in and they just watch this go down. Like, we need an audience to watch this, dude. Like, this is huge. So the rest of the scripture says that if Tramari refuses to acknowledge his sins, Gustang will resurrect as an executioner and put him to death that is insane so guys as of right now at this time in tower of god gus Stang is officially dead this is not a hoax this is not a hack he is dead so gus Stang went to such great lengths to get trauma right exposed like he sacrificed his life or at least put his life at risk just to get Traumarai's life out there and to get the facts straight. Because like I said earlier, he didn't know who to believe. He was originally believing Traumarai 100%, but Enkidu spoke until Traumarai shut him up. So ever since then, Gustang has been fabricating stuff. He's been writing stuff that is not true for his greater, I guess for N or Blossom or whatever. He's just been fabricating shit left and right and he regrets it and he wants to atone for those sins. Cause remember, he is a sinner and in that book, he even told himself that he is not worthy of the memories. So Gustang does not care about his life whatsoever. He has nothing to lose. N is locked up, Blossom hates him, she's probably sleeping with Jihad, like there's nobody in Gustang's life that he gives a shit about, like his whole family is a big fake, he did not make any more Bloodborns other than N, and that is it, like this guy has nobody else in his life that he has to care about, so what else does he have to lose? So at this point in the story, things start getting very intense. This new character pops out and he is the judge. We don't know what his name is, but he comes out of the scales of judgment and I guess he is the spirit that possesses it. And this guy looks very fucking menacing. He looks like he means business. He is like the Cyclops looking guy with the hair of the blue Thrissa, the blue fire coming out from his hair. And he has like a helmet. He has like a put a book, a pen and quill, whatever, and the same pen that Gustang probably had. Like this guy looks like he means fucking business to you. Like I, I, if I were being judged, I will be scared shitless. So this guy greets Tramurai by saying long time no see. So like right away, this guy, like if you get that greeting, you know you're in deep shit. And he says, he asks Tramurai, are you the one who killed Pobodal Gustang? And Tramurai is like, the scales of judgment. I thought Gustang got rid of it. Like, why does he still have it? So here's my theory. I said this in a stream. I think, well, it's already said that the workshop master made this, right? So Gustang probably got this specifically made for him. Like, just like uh, Tramurai got Enkidu made for him by the workshop master. So each family leader, they got their own unique item from the workshop, right? That the master himself created for them as a gift. So Gustang asked for this and he probably got it because Gustang is obsessed with keeping the truth intact. And knowing the capabilities of this item, Jihad probably did not approve. He was like, you need to get rid of that or you cannot climb with us. Or he probably shamed Gustang into getting rid of it. But of course, Gustang, he did not get rid of it completely. He kind of like put it away, stashed it or something. And I mean, Jihad is kind of carefree. Like he didn't really like dig too deep into it because I guess he didn't expect it to come to this. So yeah, like these guys, they did not really want that thing to be in Gustang's possession, especially someone like him and that is why Tramurai is so surprised that he has it so I also think Gustang got this as a gift because all the family heads know about it or at least Tramurai does I guess this was like well known so if Gustang got this as a private gift like I mean how does Tramurai like remember it you know so yeah that's why I think he got it as a gift from the workshop master and everybody else knew about it including Jihad so I'm gonna read the following dialogue of the judge because he is just a badass so let me read it all out and as you are a person who transcends the laws, no one in the tower can access your records without permission. But Poe Badal Gusang has given his life and has been granted permission to search for the evidence. From now on, we will take a look at the record of the sins committed by Traumarai. So the judge is talking to Traumarai and man, bro, like at this point at the stream, I was like going crazy. I was like, oh my God, Traumarai is about to be exposed because all his memories are just leaking out. And... 
I, I really like how SIU like kind of spelled it out, like spelled out the rules. So because Gasing died, or at least he's dead right now, this gave this scales of judgment the amount of power it needs to make this much of an impact to put Traumar's life in jeopardy. So yeah, like I said earlier, it wasn't this just random OP item that SIU pulled out of his ass. Like this is a legitimate item that SIU made and gave it a proper cost to have a proper effect. So this is the last we are going to see of the judge and I guess the rest of the cast in the present for now. From this point onwards, we are going to go into the past. I don't know how many chapters we're going to have in the past. Is it going to be like the last chapters we had? Like how many chapters was it? Like six or seven that we had in those flashbacks? Those are amazing. So instead, we're going to look at the sins committed by trauma. Right? So there's a lot of sins. Guys, I think Zenu. Zenu put a whole paragraph of all the sins committed by trauma. Like this guy has so many skeletons in his closet. It, it, it's just you lose count if you try to remember them all like it is insane so i don't know how many chapters how many flashbacks we're gonna get of trauma rise atrocities but man tower of god is looking really good right now i am so psyched for these next chapters but let's get into the next segment in the past So we go back in the past and we see Jihad and Edwan fighting the robots and then Traumarai and Gasing are running away from the robots and we also see Lee Rang. So I'm gonna be honest guys, I did not know this was Lee Rang. I thought this was a guy. If it wasn't for someone telling me in the chat that this was Lee Rang, I would have thought this was a guy all this time. Like just being honest here. Like, I thought this was two Perry or something, you know, one of these like weird family heads. But anyway, this is actually uh, Lee Rang. She is just dressed like uh, not very feminine, like kind of in the middle, I guess. I don't know. Well, I'll get I'll make a whole segment about Lee Rang in a bit, but let's get back into this. So these guys are running away. It's, there's not really much to dig in here. Like, really, let's be honest. I mean, they're just running away. They're trying to get into a teleporter to disconnect the robots. They, they, they want to defeat the robots because they are being overwhelmed. So a few things I want to comment on. First of all, it's very obvious that they are really weak here. Like they are regulars, right? But they are not like true irregulars right now. Like at this point in the story, they're like using the bong still. Like bomb was like well, right now in season two, he's using like bongs. So I'm pretty sure this is the stage they are at. They have not unlocked their Shinzu Black Hole qualities or like their qualities that they got from the data world, like Bomb got and Endorsey got. They're still using like rough forms of Shinzu at this point in the story. The main advantage that they have is that they are all irregulars and there's 13 of them. 13 irregulars are working together. Guys, that is a huge, like a huge team. Just imagine that 13 of these guys and they're all irregulars. But we also got to consider that the tower at this point in time is an untamed wild jungle. There's like these monsters all over the place. There's no stability in the tower. Like just things are running this tower rampantly. And until Jihad took over and established rule and put people as rulers of each floor, like they made the tower a lot easier to climb for everyone else. So at this time, like I want to take a look at their dialogue. So Gustang says there has to be a way. This is a game with rules. So from this point onwards, this like tournament or I guess this level is like said to be a game. Like they refer to this as a game. It's like they're playing a video game and they have to find the weakness or the key to beat the game. So I like this aspect because they can't just brute force through it, just iron fist their way through all these monsters, kill everything and win and advance to the next floor. Like they actually got to put strategy into this game. So as you can see, they are struggling. They are struggling a lot with this game. Like they don't know what to do. They're desperate. I mean, they don't look injured like Tremor this thing they look just fine their clothes are all like you know intact or not torn or anything i mean same with everyone else in this like situation here 
So they get crashed into this building. And I mean, they only have a little bit of time until they get in the teleporter. And then mommy over here, mommy uh, Lee Rain comes in and starts scolding at them. And then they go into the main floor where the God of the Guardians is there, guys. So yeah, like I was saying earlier, I love this aspect that we finally get to see this prominent character, like this power boost of a character back in the story. And we get to see his origins and like who the who he was referring to, like when he was telling Bomb that these other people they abuse the power that they awoken within the rice pot, and if Bomb will follow through like the same footing as them, and eventually Bomb gave into the power because he needed it to like defeat Jihad. So I noticed that these guys they're like really organized, or at least they try to be. So they want to prioritize communication. Like Lee Rang was telling them, "We gotta communicate, guys." And Gustang was just jumping into things, not telling anybody what's going on. And they referred to V and Jihad as, I guess, the powerhouses in their team or the leaders, you know, vice versa, I guess. I mean, Jihad is the strongest here for sure, but I don't know if V is like as strong as him, but he's definitely, I guess he's probably like a leader figure. I mean, we got to think about this critically and attack on Titan. Like Levi was the strongest like person there. He was the strongest soldier, but he wasn't like the official leader. It was like uh, Armin, Hanji, and the other guy. I forgot his name, the blonde guy. God, I forgot his fucking name. Uh, Edwin, I think. Edwin. Uh, anyway, I'm going on a tangent right there. So you see what I'm talking about? Just because you're the strongest doesn't mean you're the leader, but it, it's kind of rough, like whether to decide if these guys are either the strongest or if they are the leaders. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it would make sense if they go based on power, I guess, because it's always been said that Jihad is the leader anyway. I don't know. I, let me know what you guys think. It's probably we'll probably get an explanation later, but it's interesting to see that V and Jihad are seen as like people you can rely on when you're in a tough situation. So let's talk about the dynamics between these guys, at least Lee Rang, uh, Tramari, and Gustang. So I'm thinking Gustang is probably the oldest in this group, if not. Uh, Lee Rang is. Lee Rang is looking like she's the big sister. She's trying to keep everyone safe. And I also want to note that Gustang, like his rash personality is really like similar to Tiara. So, I mean, we can see some of Gustang's like traits being shown like Tiara's, um, her like rashness and then like uh, Dumas' sternness. Like we see some of that show off from, from Gustang and like not, the sternness not really in this segment, but I mean, with True Armor, we can kind of a little bit see it. But anyway, so, and also with True Armor, speaking of True Armor, he seems to be the youngest. So like in the stream, I said True Armor is like maybe 14 through 16 years old. And Lee Rang and Gustang, they look like adults or at least like early, like late teens, like 18, 19. So yeah, that's what I'm seeing right here. But Tramurai, he doesn't really have much impulse here. He's just following wherever these guys go. So Gustang was about to jump in and Tramurai was gonna follow with them. So it looks like Tramurai is kind of like the baby in this group. So continuing with the story, we see the God of the Guardians. So let me read what he says verbatim. He says, tower challengers destined to fail. Yo, beta testers. That is what he says. And I just want to break this down. Like I said earlier, he's this is like being narrated as a video game. Like they are beta testing a video game like to get it ready op to open to the public, which I mean, I don't know how I feel about that. Like that's very strange. These are very strange optics. Like if the 135th floor is locked away, how can the real people like the public access people beat the tower if they can't beat like these beta testers that are strong arming it? Like, I don't understand that. This is very interesting. Maybe head on is using these guys, the family heads to clear out the tower to test the waters. And then once they're no longer useful, he has bomb over here and Rachel to get rid of them, kill all of them so that people can actually complete the tower. Cause I mean, that's the whole point of the tower at the very beginning of the story head on said, you can find all the answers at the top of the tower. When bomb kept asking head on questions, like where's Rachel, what happened to her? That's all he said. He was like a broken record. All the answers, or you can find at the very top of the tower. 
And that's the whole premise of Tower of God, that you need to reach the top to get what you want. But unfortunately, nobody can reach the top because Jihad locked down the floor. So that is ruining the whole purpose of Tower of God. Like you can't even get to the God at the top of the tower. So the God of the Guardians, he says that he is going to start their revolution. In other words, he's going to help them level up. So you see how this is phrased like a video game? Like, I like this aspect. Like, SAU is making the Tower of God like a video game. And these guys are the beta testers and all that. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. I wonder, like what this means in a grand scheme of things. Like, I guess everybody that's playing now, that's participating in the tower there, it's, it's open to public access now. Like once these guys cleared everything out and set like a government and order. So yeah, so I guess this guy, the God of the Guardians, he's only here to empower like the irregulars. I mean, that only makes sense. I don't think anyone else can be empowered. And then we also know there are some beings that only hear from the irregulars as well, like Leviathan. Leviathan can only talk to irregulars, like the 10 great family heads, Jihad and Bomb. Like he, nobody else can hear Leviathan except the irregulars. So there are some beings that exist that are exclusive to either aiding the irregulars or interacting with them. So as God of the Guardians has given them instructions to cut down all the pipes to stop the power flowing to the robots, all of a sudden, V emerges from the rice pot. So first of all, these guys are talking about communication, but V does not communicate. Nobody knew V snuck in here and used the rice pot. So that, I mean, I don't know. I guess V is more rash than everybody here. I guess he is very confident in his power. I mean, just look at him. This guy, like I was saying earlier, he looks like a Chad. He looks very overconfident. I mean, Jihad is over there battling. He's, he's in a fight. He's risking his life. And V just sneaks into the rice pot, gives himself a power boost, and doesn't tell anyone about it. I mean, maybe he was going to tell them afterwards, but... I mean, these guys, they look very organized. They're trying to communicate and he just dashes off and does something on his own and doesn't inform anyone else. So V looks like that guy that if you are around him, you are safe no matter what. Just his sheer overconfidence, his aura, it's like, it's really comforting. Like you can see his dialogue. It's like, they're like, we almost died because of you. You ran off and did something on your own. And his response is, I'm sorry, as he is grinning. So he seems like that guy, like that guy that he will save you, that nothing will go wrong as long as you are around him. He also looks like really old, like he is in his 20s. I mean, obviously not old, like 50 or 60, like Madaraco, but he looks like he is one of the oldest people here that is not like like aging old you know what i'm saying like the most mature person like in her 20s everyone else is in their teens so i covered most of the main points or i guess all the main points in this chapter i really fleshed them out so now i'm gonna get into very specific things so i'm gonna start off with freaking oh, god damn it what's her name lee rang what was her name before i already forgot her name that seu gave her before so lee rang like i said she looked like a guy i thought she was a guy at the very beginning i had no idea it was actually lee rang that's why i was like oh are we gonna get an, an introduction to a new character a new family head and there was lee rang all this time so as you see huge difference from how she looks now to how she looked back in the amu saga and her outfit, God, I it's like a hit or miss. In some angles, she looks good. In some angles, she looks like bad. Like she looks like a guy. Like I can't tell from a far away shot. And her hair doesn't really help with that. I wish she let her hair down maybe two inches longer. She let it grow two inches longer. Just, just to make it easier to distinguish her. Like if it wasn't for her pink pupils, I wouldn't be able to tell if she was a guy or a girl. So yeah, Lee Rang, she's got to upgrade her outfit here. She does a little bit of a better job, but I'm gonna be honest. I kind of like the blouse here. I don't really like her outfit in the other uh, AMU's thing. I think she looks a little better here. She just got to work on her hair a little bit, like keep it a little longer. And yeah, I mean, her character is really good here. She's looking over these guys, like they're her little uh, siblings, I guess. She's making sure they're fine. And she's trying to establish a communication and safety. I mean, she's like mommy right here. So yeah, Lee Rang. Pretty cool character. She's looking out for everybody. She's making sure everybody's safe. Apparently she turns into this crazy feminist later on. I'm not sure if SIU retconned that or if that's still on the track. 
I have no idea. Maybe she is dressed in trousers and a blouse because of that. I have no idea. But, I mean, her name already got retconned. I don't know if her character got retconned about being this crazy ass feminist. We'll see. But so far, Lee Rang is a very likable character. So the God of the Guardians was introduced in chapter 169 and that character with the eye patch, I forgot his name. I am so sorry, but I think he left, like he was written off. Like he, he was like the best D rank regular and then he, he was written off. But anyway, he said that he was able to help the 10 great family leaders unlock their true powers. So just to preface that, that's what this guy did and he existed before they climbed which we already knew so yeah this guy's a real deal he is like just their power up he's there to level them up so just to recap what happens in this chapter bomb feels that he should approach a guardian and like everybody's telling him oh by the name by the way the name of the guy was sachi so sachi kun everybody's telling him that bomb you should not approach the guardian he's gonna kick your ass we can't beat him everybody that's tried approaching him or challenging him got their ass kicked and as bomb is approaching him he notes that the god of the guardians feels like urek so this guy is giving off that aura of the 10 family leaders uh, irregular aura he tells Bomb that he is the first one who came through the gate since Jihad, and he also ran into Urek, and he notes that Bomb is far weaker than Urek. So Bomb is very different from the other Irregulars. He is so much weaker than everybody else, and the God of the Guardians is unimpressed. So the God of the Guardian says the rice pot was made by a master at the workshop to train the great family leader. So this is some good lore about the rice pot that it came from the workshop after all. So the workshop is kind of like making this tower, like getting it ready for everyone to open up and to reach the top of it. And they're making all these little like things to level people up. So this just shows like the workshop, man, the workshop has so many gimmicks to it it's like the, the the imagination is the limit to how many things a workshop can do like it can give people whole power ops just by creating items for them to go in and to train it. it's like the hyperbolic time chamber in, in uh, dragon ball z so the god of the guardian says that the guardians in hell train were made to upgrade the family leaders like were made to train them and make them stronger and awaken their true power so that's very interesting so yeah i'm just recapping guys but like what's going on in case like i mean i forgot all about this stuff I'm, I'm recapping myself too but i mean since we're going back into this era we might as well like refresh our memories on what's going on and what's going on with the rice pot and the god of the guardians so by the way he looks so much different like he is in his gigantic form in these chapters and in the latest chapters he like shrunk himself and he looks gay so yeah he looks very very different so the whole point of revolution is to find your true self and then this is where bomb meets the blue thrissa the blue thrissa gasses bomb up he says you have so much power you can do whatever you want you can rule over everybody like the blue thrissa is telling this guy he can rule the world if he really wanted to and I think this is great foreshadowing to Bomb's true potential. That power he has inside of him, that sun power, I think if he made, if he maximized the, the use of his body and he learned how to use all his powers correctly and melt them into that sun power, that he could just ascend above everybody else, demolish them, but Bomb is not like that. And in his chapter, he says that he does not want to do that. He doesn't accept the full power of the Blue Thrissa. I think that was a red herring. He thought the Blue Thrissa was the main source of the power, but he's not. He's just another power up that he gained and um, throughout his journey in the tower. The main power he has is a sun power. And if he converges everything into the sun power, he will have like this ultimate power up that he has full control over and he doesn't have restrictions like with Leviathan or weird gimmicks like transformation. Well, anyway, we're not really talking about bomb. I went on another tangent again. Well, it took bomb three weeks to complete the first stage of the rice pot. So three weeks compared to 10 minutes over here with V, like that is an insane difference. And I don't know if V completed all the stages, but uh, maybe the first stage at very least. Well, Bomb still needed to complete several more stages in the rice pot, man, and he did not. And it took him three whole weeks. That is crazy. 
as I was reading this, I also want to comment on this uh, thing that the God of the Guardian said. When Bomb absorbed all the power from Abelda, from the souls, the God of the Guardian said that Bomb accepted it like nothing, like he's completely fine. And I think this has been retcon. So again, this really has nothing to do with what, what's going on in the chapter. But now that we're talking about God of the Guardians, I might as well bring this up. So I think this has been retcon because he says that someone who receives more power than they are capable of receiving should go in extreme shock or die or something along those lines. So White was receiving all the power from the souls. He was fine with that. But Kuhn and Rock, they were able to receive like White's power like nothing. Like they received it like like it was normal. And this elevated them to the power of rankers. Like I guess specifically Kuhn, because Rock, I guess you can make the argument that he's an ancient being, but Kuhn, Kuhn is like a direct ascendant, a family person, you know, family leader person. God, I forgot the, their names, but you know what I'm talking about, right? So it, it does, I think this has been retconned because that was a big power boost to become a ranker and these guys are like accepting it like nothing. Well, anyway, I just wanted to make that comment since we're already dabbling into this area of the story. So let's continue with the rice pot and the God of the Guardians. So the God of the Guardians tells Bomb that long ago, a kid asked him the same question that Bomb just asked, which was to get a lot of power so he can make everyone happy. So he is referring to Jihad and Jihad wants her to have enough power to become the king of the tower and to make everybody happy. And as a result, Jihad completely changed and he did not deliver on his promise and he just became a tyrant. So yeah, with the God of the Guardians, you can like really train and push yourself. So that's what Jihad did. He took a few extra lessons, just like Bomb with the God of the Guardians and he got a lot stronger. And yeah, he became the king of the tower and he didn't use his power for good. Something along the way, he just threw away all his emotions, humility, all that. And yeah, he just became the ruler and settled down on the 134th floor along with the other 10 great family leaders. So back to the main story, that was a like a lot of backstory or I guess a lot of context uh, reminding us about the God of the Guardians. But back to the story, maybe Jihad took an extra special route because he saw his future, he saw his destiny in the revolution, that he was gonna become the king of the tower and that he should train himself to be that way. And maybe his way is different and it's not like, uh, over here with V, he only took 10 minutes because maybe he didn't see himself being that person. So he just got the raw power from the revolution. And we're gonna also see maybe the other great family leaders take that same path. Maybe Jihad's path was different and it took longer because of his destiny, but everyone else, it's like more simple. So I'm really looking forward to what happens in the rice pot. Can only one person at a time use it? I don't know. Is it like the hyperbolic time chamber? I think it's only like two people can go out at a time. That would be pretty cool. I wouldn't be surprised if SLU does that because he does make a lot of uh, Dragon Ball Z references. So yeah, that would be no surprise, but it's good to know people can do that. But there's three people, I don't know. That would be kind of awkward leaving one out and then two just go in, but we'll see. Looking forward to this. Great to see the Guard of the Guardians return to the story and how he was before, before Jihad kind of tainted his image of the regulars and in the present to like, now with Bomb, he's all wary. He's like, oh, what if he uses his powers for bad and evil and he gets all corrupt? So really good to see that and really good to see the God of the Guardians, how he looked before. And yeah, with all that said, God, I'm reaching the end of like what I got to discuss. There's not much else to discuss. I hope we see more family leaders. I guess we'll discuss the future, what's gonna happen in the next chapter. Um, I'm pretty sure we're gonna continue from this like ending. We're gonna continue with the flashback. It wouldn't make sense to go back to a Dumas fight or something else because we are already getting knee deep in some good juicy lore and we just got a V reveal. So we got to finish. Hey, we need to remember this chapter is about Traumarai and we have not gotten anything about Traumarai. Traumarai has just been like a side character this whole entire flashback so far. So remember, we are in this flashback because Traumarai did something fucked up. So let's start theory crafting. What did Traumarai do? in this chapter well in his flashback that is considered a sin so let's think about this 
Tramari has been committing sins at least until this very point. This point where they were all young, this point when they were about to go into Rice Pot to train with the God of the Guardians. Tramari did something fucked up at this point. He looks very innocent. He looks like he can't harm a fly, but maybe the power that Jihad gained from the Rice Pot like awakened him and he started corrupting other people. So I think the person he first corrupted was Tramurai because he is like the easiest to grasp and he's like the youngest. And after that, Jihad just got full control over all the family heads and he swayed them his way. Or maybe Tramurai corrupted himself by seeing his true nature in Rice Pot, this person, this omnipotent person, who can control others, who is destined to control other people and rule over other people because he started referring to himself as a king when Amuse was around him. Like this guy was like really all up in this king leadership thing and Jihad really gassed him up with that too. So maybe Tramurai like got this way after all for just from the rice pot. Like the rice pot, like he found his true nature in there. Maybe that's why he started being such a douchebag. I also want to talk about V. So there's been rumors. I forgot if it's said in the story, but there's been rumors that V died. I think V got, well, well he is dead because he didn't accept the immor immortality contract. But uh, I think they said he, they, he killed himself, but I don't believe that. I think people orchestrated his death. Jihad planned an attack on V. And they ended up assassinating him, killing him. They covered it up. You see, this is the thing with Jihad. He always covers things up. Him and Tramurai are working together. Remember, him and Tramurai got caught by doing those experiments that Amy used to figure it out. So, yeah, these guys are not pure. V and, uh, I mean, Tramurai and Jihad, they are always doing shit. So, I wouldn't be surprised if they plotted something to get rid of V and they masked it behind something else. And I think Jihad is the one, he's the main culprit orchestrating everything. I mean, he is a master manipulator. I think he killed Traumarai's animals and he got Traumarai all riled up and he took advantage of that, of those emotions and used those to get Traumarai thinking uh, to adopt his ideology and to get him as an ally to convince other family heads to accept the immortality contract and to be rulers of the tower. So that is what I have to say, everybody. This chapter was loaded with content, loaded with theories. There's just so much going on in this chapter. And the future of Tower of God, at least these next few weeks, looks very bright. This is definitely a time to be alive for Tower of God. There's so much hype going around. There's so much excitement. There's so much mystery. So many mysteries are going to be uncovered. I guarantee it. Lots of mysteries are going to be uncovered this time. In the last flashback, there are still a lot of puzzle pieces missing, but I have faith in SIU that he is going to put shit together and he is going to actually answer some questions this time in these flashbacks. So what do you guys think of this chapter? What do you think of the scales of justice and the guy that came out of the scales of justice? What do you think of Tramurai being set on trial? Do you agree that there needs to be an audience, that there needs to be some family heads watching, at least the family heads? There needs. I think the whole tower should be watching, honestly, because this is such a big event and what do you think of Gustang officially being dead guys he is dead there is no way Gustang can come back unless Tramurai just accepts that he fucked up and he begs for forgiveness everybody wants to see Tramurai take accountability once in his life everybody wants to see that and it would be way more impactful if there was an audience witnessing this firsthand so will Tramurai bend the knee and accept that he committed these sins? Are we going to see the true nature of Tramurai in these exposed chapters? Because Tramurai is getting all of this exposed without his consent because Gusting used his royal blood or I guess his noble blood to get the administrator's approval to expose Tramurai. He went to the extreme. Is Gusting going too far? Is Tramurai's life worth this much trouble? What about the bracelet? Did Gustang pass the bracelet to someone else? Because there's no guarantee he's gonna come back alive. Or is Gustang actually gonna come back alive? Did he think this far? There is so much to look forward to, guys. There's so much to anticipate, but that's gonna wrap it up for this one hour review. I hope you guys enjoyed. This took a while to produce and to think about and to brainstorm. I really hope you guys enjoyed this. So yeah, guys, I'm gonna stream again on Monday. We're gonna go over chapter 631. 
Thank you so much for your support and for watching this video and for watching the stream. I will see you Monday if you catch the stream. Laters, guys.